Hi, this is Janet Fitch, and it is noon on Wednesday, so this must be Writing Wednesday, uh, where I answer your writing questions, your artistic questions, your existential questions about um, how to produce art uh, in the world with what you have, and uh, emotionally, psychologically, technically. Um, and uh, you can ask me questions. I have some questions uh, that have come to me um, this week, but if you have questions, feel free to put them in the comment section. And uh, if you ever want me to uh, write, to do a Writing Wednesday based on your question, uh, you can uh, send it to me through my website, um, JanetFitchWrites.com. So I hope uh, everybody's hanging in there. Hi, Jeffrey. Good to see you. Um, it is uh, spring here in LA, briefly. I heard that the Pacific Northwest uh, got a reprise of winter. Uh, wind is howling in New York. Uh, so wherever you are, uh, greetings. I uh, we're getting ready for the Los Angeles Festival of Books uh, on the 23rd and 24th of April here in Los Angeles. It's always really fun. Um, and especially I have no duties or obligations, so that makes it especially fun. Um, and uh, I have a class coming up. I, I've been talking um, recently a lot about point of view, and I've been thinking a lot about point of view. And I think that uh, it was time for me to actually systematically go through point of view. And let's see how it works. Um, uh, point of view is something that people choose often without really thinking it through. Uh, and or really understanding the strengths and drawbacks of the different uh, choices that you can make. Uh, with fiction, just like anything else, uh, when, you, when you can choose knowing the positives and negatives, hi Lisa, hi Shona, that when you could pick something knowing the weaknesses and strengths, the uses, what things are good for, um, uh, the outcome is always so much better than when you uh, choose without really thinking about or understanding even um, what might be involved. So I have always wanted to do this because uh, I would like to systematically think about how, you know, not just first and third and second, but, um, you know, the different, especially within third person, there's a lot of different possibilities there <laughs> that aren't necessarily um, contemplated before a writer makes a big decision like how they're going to tell their story. So uh, that class is set for May 13th, 14th, and 15th uh, through the Community of Writers. And if you go to my page, you'll uh, or you go to Community of Writers, it's right on their, uh, on their opening page, so communityofwriters.org. Um, and uh, it will be uh, really fun, and a lot of people have asked me questions over the years about the authorial omniscient, um, which I think bears, bears some scrutiny instead of just making some superficial assumptions about it and talking about narrative voice, which is something that we don't, we don't really explore as deeply as we should as writers. Um, so anyway, check that out. There's a, an early bird discount. Um, so to the end of the month, so, uh, that'll be available to you as well. So hi, Kama. Hi. So we do have questions. So Jeffrey, you asked me the question that you wanted to know again. I believe I answered it last week, but I think that uh, just tell me what you um, ask again and uh, you shall be 
was that the question about the um about yeah if you could restate it um i think that was the question about marina m but if you could restate it then i can restate it we got Kama from dc um so anyway i am uh Okay, uh, the first question I got from uh, a random source, um, uh, one of the inner, from the inner, uh, one of my inner web uh, correspondents, this is, uh, I'm a like it, um, was asking me, um, why did Orwell write uh, Animal Farm instead of just telling us what he thought about revolutions? That's a good question. That's a rather odd question, but uh, um, why would somebody write fiction about a situation versus uh, writing an essay in which they l just lay out what they think? And I think this is where um, fiction is so effective in that it's not an author, hi Pat, hi Elaine, it's not an author telling you what, to, what they think, but it is a way of depicting a world in which the reader can come to the conclusion, come to the conclusion on their own. So it's what has been called a sentimental education. Um, sentimental not being like oh kittens but um, the sentiments the emotions uh, the um, uh, kind of the moral sense hi Janine so um, I think that it is much more effective to have someone living through a situation and coming to conclusions themselves than it is to tell them, this is what you should think, this is what I think, uh, this, this, this. Uh, I, I do feel that fiction reaches us more deeply than, than uh, just an essay or discursive, discursive um treatment of a subject um you know i i think i could read about the gulag i could read the gulag archipelago uh by solzhenitsyn um but when i read his very very short book a day in the life of ivan denisovich and i'm living through a day of being a prisoner in the gulag i know so much more about what kind of grim life uh, is going on in the thousands and thousands of thousands of people who's, you know, who are aggregated in a big history like the Gulag Archipelago. When you have one person and you're living through their experience, you experience it so much more deeply because you can, under, you can put yourself there. So the fact that Orwell wrote Animal Farm instead of telling us about his feelings about revolution. He's not a pamphleteer, you know. I think that the work of fiction will live on where an essay about has his feelings about revolution may not. Because somebody tells you something, here's what I think, and you take it in on a certain level. It's like, hmm, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. But for me, anyway, fiction makes you live it. And so a lived experience is going to be more profound and affect us in a more profound way. We've lived through that. It's a little different than an essay where somebody is just laying out their, their feelings or their program. So let's see if uh, Jeffrey has put in his question yet. Jeffrey, post your question. I will go ahead and answer it. Um, here we go. Um, so he had a question two weeks ago that um, um, about uh, that I wasn't able to get to. I thought I did get to this. How do you think Marina would react to what is going on in Russia and the Ukraine in the mo in modern times? What would be thoughts? What would her thoughts be? And who 
whose side would she be on? Um, well, she's a character in the Russian Revolution. So we have in that book, there is a lot of, um, in, in my novel, both in, in Marina and in Chimes, uh, there is this issue of propaganda and trying to even under, wrap your head around what's, what's going on. The Russians, you know, and anybody in a war zone, anybody, you know, who is being locked down, um, just trying to get the news, trying to understand what's going on, standing there in front of a wall newspaper that's a propaganda sheet, you know, Pravda, mid-revolution and then you're trying to figure out what's what's really going on so that's not just marina but that's the common population at that time trying to figure out what's going on uh, and i think that's going on now i think the average russian is trying to understand now everything is shut down trying to even get the news and then there are people who just believe what they're reading i think marina is an idealist, and I think that she would never be a pro-Putinist. Um, I think that she had all kinds of political ideas in the, in the novel uh, about uh, the way the Bolsheviks, once in power, the difference between what they said and what they were doing. I mean, that's the heart of her coming of age in the novel is the realization that you know people say you know people once people get into power they tend to stay in power and do whatever they need to do to stay in power and they really don't care about what they profess to be their ideals uh, you have to look at what people do and not what they say and under the bolsheviks it was like oh no listen to what we're saying don't look at what's actually going on uh, and so she learned to look not to listen so much to what people say, but to see what was actually happening and not justify it, not try to justify it. Um, and, um, you know, a champion for the weak, you know, rather than a glorification of strength. Uh, so I think that uh, if she was in Russia now, uh, she would really be struggling um, to somehow make a make an have an impact um she'd been imprisoned by the on very that didn't was a really hellacious uh experience for her i think that you know there was a reason that putin didn't uh have any celebrations of the 100th anniversary of the russian revolution i don't think he wants people to remember that the people got rid of the czar uh, but the people also let the democratic moment pass, as did Marina. You know, her father was part of that interim government that could have done something if the people had supported it. But the people didn't because they'd been so radicalized that they didn't see this was their moment to seize, you know, to um, have a democratic uh, form of government. Uh, revolutions move very qu quickly, just like wars do. And um, uh, they missed their they missed their moment. Uh, Marina in Chimes of Lost Cathedral, there is a gathering of the Russian intelligentsia uh, living at the House of Arts and living at the House of Scholars. And it was a Pushkin Day event, and and the poet Bloch spoke about Pushkin and about. Um, uh, his idea of, of, of free, the poet's freedom, the need for that, being able to think freely in a, you know, in the face of, of the Bolshevik um, gathering uh, of all power into their hands. Uh, you know, it was the, the ideals of revolution turned out to be a really, you know, vicious real politic. And uh, one of the anarchists in the book um, uh, say, says fairly early on that he didn't believe in it, that, you know, in the 
Bolsheviks or anybody else that, you know, he believed that once people get power in their hands, they're going to keep it. They're going to do their best to keep it. And, you know, Marina notices how the Bolsheviks keep changing their purported ideology um, to suit what they wanted to stay in power. Um, oh, forget what I said two weeks ago. You know, now this is what we're saying. And, and in, you know, if you don't stay on the bus, if you don't follow the zigzags, you know, then you're going to fall off the bus. And so people were scrambling uh, to be, you know, to stay on the bus and just, you know, it looks like our Republicans and how that, you know, that's all working. I think Marina would be very much... Um, you know, just very aware of who Putin is, was, and um, the, you know, the way the gathering up of power um, uh, was very much the way uh, what she was seeing. So what else can I say? Here's a question from uh, Malaika. I saw it. I don't want to let it go by. Um, I want to know if you will cover revising and editing for point of view in your upcoming workshop. Well, you'll definitely use use it in revision and editing because it will give you a sense of what the possibilities of the point of view that you've chosen uh, or the whoever you're editing, you know, what they've chosen, and perhaps er things that they've overlooked that they didn't realize they could do or that was a possibility with the, cho with the choice that they had or whether they were satisfied with the choice that they'd made. So, you know, it'll all be integrated as revision and editing are part of writing. You know, they're part of it, so I, I don't separate the two. Um, so Llewellyn has a question. Let's see what you got here. What do publishers consider valuable writing? Vivid, you know, where I think, you know, as vivid and beautiful and propulsive as they can find, you know. I think those are kind of the three axes that that uh, a publisher is always looking for. Is that is it compulsive? You know, is it propulsive? Do you you know you can't just put it down anywhere you want to keep reading? Is it beautiful? Is it really so well written that the reader kind of gasps? You know, how well things are described? How vivid and luscious is it? How real? You know, um, so the beauty of the writing, the, how vivid is it, and uh, looking for um, propulsiveness, the, uh, just not necessarily, you know, car chases and all that kind of stuff, but just, like I'm reading this, I, I, I just reviewed this book uh, on my Goodreads page, which Anybody know, I, I'm completely addicted to Goodreads. And this is The Baudelaire Factor by Lisa Robertson. And she does not do anything conventional in this book, but it is so blisteringly intelligent and beautiful that you just can't stop reading. It's one surprise after another, one quotable line after another. Um, it's just, uh, just a pow in the face. Hi, Jill. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, so I, I highly, um, I, I highly recommend that. And I just think that what publishers are looking for is great writing and a, and a um, it doesn't have to be the story that moves, but there's something about the book that is comp really compelling. And it could be the voice, it could be the perspectives, it could be the, the world that you're creating. It's something that is really exciting about it and keeps the reader engaged. Let's see, what else? We got any other questions here? 
Um, here's here's one. Um, how do I piece together all the countless individual scenes of a story I started years ago and want to complete, put all together? I have a storyline-ish, but not sure how to tie it together. It does not follow a standard plot outline idea. So this is obviously a um, something that they'd started a long time ago and have bits and pieces but individual scenes. So we know all writing is scenes. Not all of them. This is not. This has some scenes, but it's mostly sensibility. Um, but this person has scenes. So when I wrote White Oleander, I was kind of intimidated by the idea of writing about a, a girl moving through foster care um, and this crazy mother, and it all seemed very intimidating. So what I told myself I would do is I would write anywhere I could see a scene vividly. From anywhere in the book, I wouldn't have to know like where it came in. Um, but anywhere I could just see something very clearly, I would write that and throw it in a box. And then if I could see another scene, I would write that scene, throw it in a box. And eventually the box filled up. And then I um, did three hole punch and put it and of the papers and put started putting the scenes in a notebook. I started with, I don't remember what it was. Um, I had the short story, so I started basically, the first three chapters were the short story that I'd written. And then turn the page, what comes next? And I look at all these different scenes that I have, and oh, I could put this scene in there. Put that scene, turn the page, you know, and how about this scene? Oh, it seems like it would go later. So put it at the back, and then put other things. And by the time I'd put everything from the box into the binder, and everybody knows I love ring binders. I like to handle things physically. I'm not so good uh, organizing big chunks of material on the computer. It's hard for me to picture it. So I like handling the paper. And so I put try scenes in different places and turn the pages and until I had sort of some sort of a flow of what would come where. And I found that there were, um, scenes that just didn't fit. There was just nowhere to put them. They, they, they just didn't, didn't go with the, into the flow. So I put those aside. And then I, there were places I could see that needed something here. Like I, I needed something. I, I say that there were two scenes that were group scenes where people were talking and it was just like, you know, too many or, or two many scenes of two people talking, usually. Um, so I, indoors, say. So what I would do is take a piece of paper, just take a piece of, you know, take a piece of paper, and I just wrote TK on the piece of paper. And anybody who is a journalist knows TK means uh, to come. Just something. It needs something here not try to solve that problem, but just to note, need something here uh, for, often it, it's for, um, kind of for, the, it needs, like I compose my work kind of musically, so it's like it needs a movement that's not there. Uh, if I have indoor scene, two people, indoor scene, two people, I want something else in between. Um, like one section, does this section come first? Which home comes after this? Um, so I had, uh, I started with um, the um, kind of where the short story was, so the first three chapters of White Oleander. And then the next scene that I saw, had seen clearly was the scene of dying the 
foster mother's hair in the closed bathroom. It's such an intimate scene and such an awful thing to do for a f stranger. It would be very ups kind of upsetting. But I knew that wasn't the next thing that happened. I knew there had to be a scene, you know, maybe a different home before that one. Um, so my actual, the writing of the home um, in Big Tuh in Tahunga Canyon um, was, I'd written it later, but it needed to be brought up. Uh, and the other home was going to be pushed back. So uh, you, you build it the way you would build a, uh, a playlist, a set list if you were a DJ, you know, and you've ever done live radio where you haven't planned out what you're going to do. You just put something on and then you think, what comes after that? Oh, okay, oh, I know, you know, Iggy Pop skull you know skull ring and then what comes after skull ring what would fit there and you you're looking through the music library while the song is playing and you find another the next thing and it could be from rhythm it could be instrumentation it could be mood um but you kind of find a flow and that's what you're looking for if you put things together in this way so um so that's that's the way i i I've done it. It's you lose a lot. There, are, there's going to be stuff that is never going to fit. Um, in writing that way, you're going to write scenes that just aren't going to be able to go into the flow of the book. But it's a different way to construct the book. Constructing something chronologically is not the only way to tell a story. It is not the only way to construct a book. And if you're having trouble get if if you're intimidated by the idea of chronology you can just write scenes about the same character and find a flow for them uh things don't have to connect you know we're we're i think that people waste a lot of time trying to get from this scene to this scene you know just put that scene in, put that scene in, and then worry about connecting them some other time. If you need to, you might not need to. You know, it's a fragmented world and people are used to fragmentation. They're used to seeing cuts in film. Um, none of this is going to surprise people. A mixed chronology where you move backwards and forwards in time does not phase people anymore. There's a wonderful book uh, called A Prayer for Travelers that I came across a couple of years ago, um, which tells a story purposely out of order. And the chapter numbers also move around that way. It, it was very well done. Let me, let me grab that. So this was A Prayer for Travelers by Ruchika Tamar. And she would start with, like, you start with chapter one, uh, 31. You start with 31, that's the first chapter. And then you go to two. <laughs> and then you go to five. And you go along and you're, you're, you're uh, accepting this. And then gradually you start to realize, oh, this five does go chronologically after two and before 10, you know, and then 31, you start to notice what 32, when 32 comes up, then it's like, oh yeah, and that, that was 31 that we started with. It's, it makes kind of an interesting treasure hunt in that novel. Uh, that was very well done. What else? What else do we have here? We have what are some good ideas, suggestions, prompts for a fantasy novel? Well, you pick your world, I guess. You know, you figure out, are you into like Maid Marian and Robin Hood? Are you into, you know, the Merlin-y kind of stuff? Or what kind of fantasy is your fantasy? Um, 
you know, some fantasy sci-fi. I mean, Philip Jose Farmer liked to have sex with aliens in his book. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, sexy aliens, why not? You know, it depends on the quality of your imagination. I mean, fantasy, like science fiction, is an area of fiction that requires more imagination than um, contemporary or historical fiction. Um, so you have, you know, if you are uh, interested in, in fantasy, if you like fantasy, and you have that kind of, of overactive imagination, I mean, really uh, imagination, like world building type of imagination. I would say some good prompts would be, you know, um, how do plants grow in a world with two suns? Um, prompts, um, uh, you know, have my character, you know, my character, your character can walk on the ceiling. You know, how do they move throughout, through their house? And just write movement. Um, is there a secret? You know, fantasy novels, there's a, um, in Nine Princes in Amber, uh, Zelazny, I, I was a big Zelazny fan. Um, there is a pattern in the center of this world, uh, in a castle, in the center of the castle called, um, uh, Amber. And there's a pattern, there's nine brothers and sisters and they can walk the pattern and go anywhere in the, in this world. Um, so that's like having a, uh, like a labyrinth in a cathedral, right, the, on the floor that you walk and have a meditation. Uh, so is there some sort of central mystery or central PowerPoint in your uh, fantasy, um, fantasy novel or fantasy story? Um, you could pick a color, you know, that would become emblematic of uh, what is purple emblematic of in your world. Um, that kind of thing. Um, so those are some, a couple of prompts. And any, anybody who has a good prompt uh, for a fantasy or sci-fi novel, feel free to... Oh, Kama thought that my foster kid uh, world in White Oleander was well done. Thank you. I'm glad. I appreciated that. Um, so Fantasy novel. My good suggestion for fantasy, fantasy and sci-fi, um, is that the more fantastic or unlike our world, your world is, the world you're building is, the more you have to make it sensually real. The more sounds, sights, smells, colors, levels of landscape, things that are close, things that are far away, the use of sound, the more real it has to be so that we can really walk in and see that world. That's a suggestion for you. Um, what else? We have, here's a question. How do you write a tyrannical madman or woman, let's say, uh, um, a tyrannical mad person who's not even a villain and make him likable him her them likable well tyrant is already pejorative we know it's already a negative trait a tyrant i mean that's pretty you know uh, I, it's hard to imagine a tyrant who is not a villain, you know, although no one is a villain to themselves. No one is a tyrant to themselves, you know. They feel that they're a strong man. They feel that they're, you know, they're 
that they're a focus of history, that they're an ele you know, that they're acting out for history. Um, no one is a tyrant to themselves. So if you want to make a tyrant who, who, to not be a villain, then it's, if you should make him first person. Because everything he'll do will be totally justified, but he'll still be a villain because a reader is not stupid, you know? The reader will see what they're doing and they've just killed 40 people and, you know, there are thousands of people. They've just invaded their neighbor's country. Um, uh, how do you have a tyrant who is not a villain, who is likable? Someone who is only a tyrant in their mind, who has absolutely no power whatsoever. A tyrant who is uh, in an assisted care home, maybe, would be a way to go. No power, and they can remember their, you know, their actions, and yet they've got to go and eat their pureed food. Um, that's an idea. Um, People who are mentally ill um, are uh, can have, you know, really, I mean, that can be a very terrifying place. So somebody like that who's in the Bardo or somebody like that who is being beset by um, monsters um, would make them a little bit more... Um, an object of pity, uh, as well as a monster. Uh, a very interesting book that that you might take a look at would be uh, The Master Margarita by Bulgakov, uh, who has a character, he has Pontius Pilate as a character. And you might find that really interesting, the way he handles that. Um, because there's a monster but somebody who also is understandable in his way. I don't know if you're going to make people actually likable, but, you know, to make them less flatly villainous, um, I guess is going to be the way, the best way to go with something like that. Hmm, do we have any questions here? Feel free to write them in comments. I have time for it today. Um, oh, here's... <laughs> is it acceptable to write... Uh, let's see, Wendy says, Esteban Treba in House of the Spirits by Isabella Allende is one. Well, that's interesting. Um, Is it acceptable to write several stories about the same character? Like two totally different stories, like one where they're a detective and another where they're a doctor or whatever. Well, there that's a suggestion for my my fantasy novel writer or sci-fi novel writer. Um, to have the same character, it's almost like reincarnation. Um and coming in, you know, coming in to your life, and now I'm a doctor, and now I'm a race car driver, and now I'm a nursery school teacher. That's really interesting. Um, there is a really interesting uh, novel by uh, Michael Cunningham called Specimen Days. Orlando, Lisa says. Um, there's a, a novel by... Um, Michael Cunningham called Specimen Days, which is like three novellas done each in a genre. So there was, one was a Western, one was a, was it a romance? And one was sci-fi. And they were three characters, but they're, in each story, they're the same people but now they're in a Western, and now they're in a romance, and now they're in a, a sci-fi. And uh, one is past, one is present, one is future. And uh, that was 
I think that worked with this idea of taking the same characters but putting them in different different moods or modes. Um, in I can think of or, there's Orlando. That's interesting. There where there's a man and a woman. There is um, oh something else just flitted across my brain like a beautiful blue butterfly and and took off. <laughs> it, it'll come to mind again. Uh, you know, it reminds me of the Borges story, um, uh, the lottery in Babylon, where um, they the society operates with a lottery that each year you decide it, the lottery. You're just it decide it's decided by lottery whether you will be a slave or a master, a poet or a baker, and uh, um, you know, there's an interesting way to, to run a society so that you're the baker this year and next year you're the, you know, kickboxing king or something. <laughs> so Malaika says, what do you suggest to students when they struggle with endings? Well, I think everybody struggles with endings because you want the ending to prove to to be the outcome of the upshot of everything that has gone before. You want an ending that it it's like it comes down to a point where something is changed. The kind of the proof of the, if your story was a was a mathematical equation, then the ending would be the proof. The, 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 you worked out the theorem and then the, the end, the sum. Uh, uh, and you want it to resonate, so you don't want to do it so cleanly that it just seems like, you know, putting a bow on it. And then there's, it also, op a good ending will open back up a little bit. So say, Anna Karenina. Anna Karenina, the ending isn't where Anna Karenina dies. Anna Karenina dies, and then there is one more section where Levin, who is sort of the Tolstoy stand-in, has to come to terms with his own new family, fatherhood, etc. So he's survived where um, Anna died. And it really is like stepping over her body, uh, this last section. And we, what Tolstoy is telling us is that life goes on. Here she's had this terrible tragedy and she's gone and life goes on, which is the, the real tragedy of the book. Um, what do I suggest to students when they struggle with endings? You're looking for resonance back through the book. Um, it should bring the elements that you've been using, the motifs, um, the themes, which is something that you can't, you don't want it to become too conscious in your mind of what your themes are. That's kind of more the job of the reader. But you want to make sure that it is, you've solved the problem of the book in, the, in terms of the problems that you've raised and the issues you've raised and the points that you've raised and not come and solved and ended a kind of, ended a different book, you know, almost, or hurried it. And if a person really liked the book, they always complain that it ends too fast. I'm just warning you. Um, it shouldn't be out of left field. Uh, you'd say, you know, a student working on stories, story endings are different than novel endings. 
um, a story ending is extremely subtle. You have to be very careful not to put your finger on the scale. You know, it, it comes down into the suggestion of a re resolution or a new way of going somewhere. And then it, it kind of opens a little bit to the future before you cut it off. Um, I, so I would say, what are they struggling with? You know, do they not know what their, where their story is? So the ending kind of, they can't figure out how to end it because they don't even know what it was really about. Um, it's usually not about the plot, unless you're writing kind of pot boilers. Um, Johnny, Lou, you know, is a drunk and loses his wife. And what is he going to do about it? You know, what does he do about it? You know, does he kind of decide that he's going to have to be by himself? And then he sees something or thinks of something that spins it in a different way. So I think the best thing that students who struggle with endings should read, you know, 20 or 30 short stories, or if you can get them to do it, you know, or pick some for them. And then write a little something about, like, show us the, you know, have them quote the ending, and then tell us what, what is that doing? How does that ending work? Um, very valuable to start looking at other stories and noticing how they work so that when it's time for them to end their story, um, you could say, God, you know, remember, you know, remember a uh, lady with a lap dog. This sort of reminds me of that. The better read they are, the more of a language you'll have in common to be able to point out resonances with, with other kinds of stories. You know, even as you read your, as you read novels, try to characterize the ending for yourself. You know, what kind of an ending is this? Um, say for instance, there's a kind of ending I call the one through one flew over the cuckoo's nest ending, which is where the protagonist dies but they have made such an example of their thinking that they have passed those ideas or ideals to another character who then is able to complete the action that the hero, the protagonist who is dead now, um, or permanently out of the, uh, ha having no ability to finish their own action and somebody else picks up the torch. I call that a one flew over the cuckoo's nest ending. And so if you start to look at how different stories end, be they novels, be they short stories, and then see if you can characterize in language what they are doing. I have a section in my notebook, one of my notebooks, that has like 40, the last paragraph of maybe 30 short stories to remind me of the ones that I thought were super effective and how exactly does that end? Let's see if I can find that. Excuse me for turning my back on you. Um, let's see, you see I love ring binders. Let's see if I can find that for you. Ending. This looks like it would be in here. Nope, not that one. But anyway, um, got them, but I've got them in various notebooks. Let's see if I can find the ones with all the different endings. Uh, 
and beginnings as well. I'll have just a whole section of really good openers, books that I thought did that very well. Uh, but endings are worth collecting and, and, and analyzing, you know. Unfortunately, this writing thing uh, does, it doesn't happen in a passive way, you know, the learning of it. You can have, you can read a, you know, read somebody writing about the ending of this book or that book, but until you do the work yourself, it just doesn't, you don't get any better. You know, like, you don't get any better watching somebody else play tennis. You know, you've got to play tennis yourself and make, you know, and work and sweat over it a bit. Let's see. Yeah, this it's in this one somewhere. Um, but there's got to be endings that you finish the story and you go, what? And then you have to go back and go, how in the world did they get that? Um, and then you see how it, it kind of lifts. You get a look at something and then it opens the future. Uh, there, there are some wonderful uh, examples of this in George Saunders' A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, where he takes seven uh, major Russian short stories and uh, analyzes them moment, you know, like moment by moment, piece by piece, and does talk about the endings. Um, and it, it should inspire you or give you example of a way to read that is available to all of us uh, if we're if we're willing to slow down. And notice how it how it's working, you know. The we learn from reading. Uh, I know that there's a huge section in one of these, of the, <laughs> but it's not jumping out at me. Hmm. Well, my apologies. But there are many uh, famous short stories that are worth looking at the end. You know, um, this is a classic. Get a get a book, 50, 50 American short stories. You know, one of those classic. You know that has like big two hearted river and and uh, um, stories like that. Lady with lap dog. And, um, notice how they end, and then. I have trouble with the endings of the New Yorker stories because a little evanescent sometimes for my taste because I'm a novelist. I'm a little bit more, um, a little more forceful with my uh, conclusions, but definitely worth taking a look at Best American, this year's Best American, last year's Best American, and look at those stories and look at the ending and then ask yourself, you know, how do you, how does it end? Why did they pick this ending? And don't just let, Malika, don't just let them off the hook going, well, I don't know. Because engagement is what all education is about, right? And all education is self-education. You know, you can have a leader, you can have a facilitator, but nobody can think for you. So a student who doesn't want to engage on that level just won't learn, you know. All they're doing is copying. They can't. They can't take it in. I know that now. I'm all now. I'm going to be thinking about those endings. But yeah, write them down. Write down thirty par a paragraph. The last paragraph of thirty short stories, and really have the student look at them and tell you what is going on. Lisa says, Tar Baby has an exceptionally memorable ending. Um, yeah, I'll, 
I'll look for them and see if I can throw that in. So MJ says, would love to hear your perspectives on ending a scene, a chapter, in context of this discussion. Um, yeah, okay, where do you end a scene? In a scene, something changes. So I come in a mood and I leave in a different mood, right? Something has caused me to change my emotion. I, the character learns something, sees something that they cannot go back to the way they were before. So say I have a scene like I come in uh, really excited. I'm going to meet my lover. You know, it's like, oh, you're here, you know. And then, of course, something happens that ruins my mood. And I can't go back to the yippee skippy thing that I had before. It's like I come in all excited and there's, you know, John. Uh, and then John says, I got something to tell you. And it's like, I already don't like this tone of voice. I already don't like the way he's still standing in the doorway instead of coming in the room. You know, it's like, yeah. It's like, you know, I, I have another family. I'm not really single. And then my feelings about that, do I struggle to pretend I don't care? Do I start screaming and yelling? Do I start throwing stuff? Do I say mean things to John about something I can think of just because I want to hurt him. Um, and then how does it end is like your launch into the next piece of the story. So am I going to slink out? Am I going to break something? Uh, am I going to have an internal, like, you know, I'm going to tear out and I, I just put a big gash in the, in his lawn um, so you end, it really shows you who the character is and how they're changing, how they're changed. Do I leave quietly, shutting the door behind me? Am I resigned? You know, it shows who that character is, um, how they leave a scene, um, the important thing is not to go past the ending of the scene. You know how somebody um, will make a point. <laughs> Maybe I'm doing it. <laughs> somebody will make a point and then go on beyond the point that they've made. It's like the scene is over and they're still talking. Um, don't start another scene inside the scene. You know, let the emotional movement finish. So we've gone from uh, uh, excited to um, furious or despondent or something like that. And then scene ends. Um, so Lisa says, you started to describe how short story endings and novel endings were different. If a short story ending is extremely subtle, what would you say about novel endings? Novel endings, you know, I, I feel them kind of viscerally. So I would say a novel ending is like ringing the big gong. You know, after, uh, you don't want anything after that. You don't want to read another book for a week or so you just want to it's still reverberating you know so with a novel ending you're looking for a resonance like that um that uh that it opens up a bit into the future it doesn't just it's not the climax of the book it's what comes after the climax uh that's your ending so don't feel like, you know, you discovered the real truth about Dan and you and your parentage and, and then all's well and you're out of there. You know, take your time. 
you know, you've just been through a novel, take your time to, you know, bandage the, the blisters and uh, put some iodine on the cuts and um, let, let it digest, let the end, let the, the ending helps you digest, the reader digest the story. So you don't yank them out before they've had a chance to let it, let it settle. So let's see how we did. Well, very cool. It looks like I got you all. Um, so anyway, uh, signups are open for the point of view class, uh, May 13th, 14th and 15th, communityofwriters.org. And, um, Hope to see you next week for Writing Wednesday. Okay, thank you.